I am absolutely excited to be here today, as I am every time I'm here, but I just feel, uh, you'll have to bear with me today, I feel very emotional, super emotional, just because uh, yesterday at this end was just something else, it was really uh, powerful, and uh, my time with the Lord this week has been really super intimate, and I've really been pushing for that, I don't, I don't want the dry spells, I, want, I just want Him, I want His beauty, I want His presence. I want him to rest on me. I want to rest my head on him. And uh, happy to say this week was a really, really good week uh, for that. Uh, so praise God that he's so faithful to just love me. And when you press in, he's there and he goes for it. Jesus, we worship you. There's no one like you, Jesus. There's no one like you. King of kings and Lord of lords and lover of my soul, I worship you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. You're so worthy. Who is worthy? But one is found worthy, and that is you, Jesus. Jesus, don't don't hold yourself back because of me. Jesus, breathe on this word today. May it, may it pierce your spirit and go deep and hold. I just thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Every piece of you is lovely and beautiful. There is no one like you. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Spirit eyes. That is the title for today. So the, I'm going to talk a little bit about the send. I think the send was uh, super great. Um, I don't know. How many people do you guys think were there? There wasn't 60,000 people there, I don't think. Maybe. Maybe. Probably about 60,000. It was so good to, to look around and see people encountering Jesus in the Kansas City Chiefs Stadium. I mean, like, it just... Ugh, that's why I'm so emotional. It's like when I look at him, I'm just like, <laughs> like I just start crying and start start breathing all funny. And it's just like I just love seeing people encounter Jesus with their hands up and their eyes closed. And tears running down their face. It's just my favorite place to be. That's where I'm at right now. <laughs> if you guys haven't seen me preach before, this guy cries a lot. <laughs> but I'm okay with that because that's who Jesus made me to be. He made me soft and tender and emotional, and I have six girls, so that really helps in that atmosphere. <laughs> I, like I said before up here, I, I really don't know how I would raise boys. It's just, I don't have a, God's like, this guy gets girls. Just, they're like, you sure? Yes, all girls. Just six. Hopefully it just stays at six. But if he wants to bring me another girl, then praise God. <laughs> all right. So... I have to take a little bit of time to brag on the church. I love this church. I thank you guys that you have, you have created an atmosphere where we, we can come and worship the one true king. We can come and get fed, and we can come have fellowship and community. And like I said, every time I'm up here, that is exactly what I'm looking for, and that's exactly why I'm here, because you guys love people so well and so unconditionally. I just love it. I thank you guys for that. Just weird. I don't see Bill in a spot. Sorry, Bill. We took <laughs> Bill and Nancy. We took it. <laughs> There's two spots up here at front, but you guys are good there, right? Uh, I got some friends here, lovely friends. These guys are from South Dakota. Uh, wonderful. Come on, give it up. Yeah. <laughs> I want to start with uh, Jenny and Dustin. Super awesome. I remember being in prayer meetings, and we would be praying for these two. Uh, Jeff and Autumn, they'd have, uh, they were our pastors at our old church, and we would just pray for Jenny and pray for Dustin, pray that God would encounter their hearts. Because once he did, there would be a lot of people that would come after. And are we seeing that today? Absolutely. Like, just people are getting wrecked. And uh, these two have, like, a oikos, a, a severe influence in uh, Huron, where we live, that they can reach people that people just can't reach. Like, they, they just have uh, the in with them. They grew up with them. They're around them. You guys are so important. 
chase. <laughs> Guy with the dreadlocks over here. I grew up with this man. It was really fun. We did a lot of bad stuff together. <laughs> It's probably why God didn't give me boys, because there'd probably be one like me and Chase. <laughs> we used to ransack cars and do drugs and, you know, steal stuff, break into things. Just overall, weren't very, what people would say, great people. But this is such a testimony of how the Lord redeems, because we are not who we used to be. You know what I mean? And it made me so proud to see you lift your hands and just worship Jesus. And how proud I felt, he felt even more proud. He loves it, and it, it, it moves his heart. It ravishes his heart. And we got Anna. Anna right here. She's been a really good friend of my wife and our family. Uh, she is an intercessor all day. If you guys ever need prayer, right here in the front, fire comes out of her mouth and through her hands. So good. Shiloh. Love Shiloh. We actually named our daughter after Shiloh. Uh, she was a missionary to India, and um, she has um, what I would call spirit eyes. Um, she has better spirit eyes than most of the people I've ever met in my life. She sees people for who they are, not what they look like or what they do or where they work. She sees them for who they are. I love all you guys. That's enough. We're going on. <laughs> All right, so um, before I shared that I was a stay-at-home dad, and um, there we go. I was a stay-at-home dad for a while, uh, about three or four years, and as our kids started to get older, um, we, Cindy was like, you know, maybe we only got like two kids, maybe we can throw some in daycare, and you can go get a job, and you can go do what you want, because, you know, I was getting kind of bored at home. I don't like taking care of sheep. I never wanted sheep. I never wanted chicken. I never wanted any of that stuff, but I took care of them because I love my wife, and that's what she wants, and that's what we're going to have. <laughs> but she, she knows that, and she was like, hey, why don't you go get a job? Why don't you go do something? And what was really cool is, like, we didn't really need it financially. Our rent was like $300 a month, and, you know, we were living pretty comfortable. She was a welder, so we made pretty good money. So, I could, the world was mine, basically. I could, you know, wherever I want to work, I can go get a job doing that. Uh, I'm very employable. I can get a job anywhere I want to, I feel. So I said, okay, let me pray about it. And I said, God, uh, I'm going to get a job if, if I have your blessing, because I was doing a lot of, like, ministry stuff and everything. So if it's God, if that's where you want me, show me, and then I will go, you know. Make me a vessel. Make me an offering. Send me. Go. Um... So that night, that very same night, I had a dream, and in that dream, I was walking through Walmart, and there was these ruffians, these kids, and they were just visibly stuffing stuff into backpacks and, like, fighting and being really, really rude, and I was like, that's not okay. I was like, somebody needs to do something about that. So I went and I got, I got a manager, and I said, hey, come here. What is going on here? That's not, is this allowed in your store? Is this acceptable? And they looked at me, and they said... I don't know. It's your job. You kick them out. And then I woke up. And then that day I went to a career place to go see their job postings. And right the very first job started with A, asset protection. And that was a job I've always wanted. I've always wanted to be a secret shopper and dress in normal clothes and, you know, just just do stuff. Um, so it said asset protection, and that was, I didn't even look any further because God said that's the one. And I was just like, really? I'm going to go from ministering and, like, youth pastor and all this stuff, and you want me to bust people stealing? And he was like, oh, no. He's like, you have to see deeper than that. I want you to stand up for righteousness in your town. And I was like, whew, okay. So... I have no training in this job, no nothing, and I go and I I apply for the job, have three interviews, and I'm just not even nervous during my interviews because I know that God told me I'm going to get this job, and I'm going to do this job. So I get the job, and as I'm doing this job, I become extremely successful at it, like super successful, uh, like almost number one in South Dakota, even to the point where I'd go and train people at other stores. And even people who have been working the job for, you know, four or five years, I would still and go show these people 
what I do for my job. And that was a little tough when you walk into somebody else's store that's been there for four or five years and you've only been working for a year at the job. They get pretty hard and bitter and all that kind of stuff, but that was my opportunity to love them and say, hey, I'm not here to show you how to do your job better. I'm actually here to learn from you as well. I just want to show you what I do. You show me what you do. We'll put it together, and we'll be a team. But what was really cool is not a lot of people knew that I was basically cheating. I felt like I was cheating because every day I would walk the store, and I would just be praying in tongues. And then um, I, would, I would say, God, I can't do this job. I cannot stand up for righteousness if you do not help me. And this is where the term spirit eyes came from for me because he said, well, you need spirit eyes. And I said, God, help me see what you see. And next thing you know, like every single person I followed ended up stealing, which was absolutely crazy because I was like, God, I can't do this. You have to do this. Um, but on the, on the plus side of this conversation, when I would get people in my office and, you know, like, why are you sending me to jail? Why are you doing that? I was like, I didn't steal. You know, you did. And why are you making me do that? So I got put in a lot of tough situations in my old town um, for standing up for righteousness. But no matter how much I was cussed at or screamed at or spit at or we'd go out and we'd go eat. Was it easy, Cindy? before we left our old town? No, it wasn't too easy. There was a lot of like persecution coming our way and stuff like that. But my spirit was so excited because I am living in God's will. I'm doing what God told me to do, and I'm loving people. So going on to a job that I didn't even know like anything about, and um, God started to show me things like body language and eyebrow raises and uh, just the way somebody's shopping. Like even now, I can I can go take you into Walmart, and I guarantee I'll find a find a shoplifter or two. But with that being said, it's it's the listening to the spirit, even in something as simple as working at Walmart, is what was successful. And I got to I got to walk with the Lord and see what He sees and say what He says. Because ninety percent of the time, when I pulled somebody into my office. They don't want to see me. They don't want to talk to me, and they are not nice to me. So that really helped me out in a ministry setting as well because, like I said, I I want people to feel more loved by God than when I first got into the conversation. And this is this is that's just a little uh, story about Walmart. My whole my whole sermon's not about Walmart. I promise. My friends always joke around and said you were a security guard at Walmart. I get a lot of crap for it. But praise God that he is good. All right, I'm going to go into Matthew. We're going to read a little bit of the Bible. Matthew 6, 19 through 24. It says, uh, and I'm reading out of the NLT. I just like it. It's pretty plain and simple for me. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desire of your heart will also be. Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy... Your whole body is filled with light. When your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Whew. I was reading that this week, um, and it just kind of wrecked me, and that's like where like the spirit eyes was coming in, um, because people need to understand that what you look at affects you, like what you watch for movies, you know, and then even even further, not necessarily just the eyes, but the ears as well, you know, what you listen to affects you, you know. 
Um, I used to listen to some music that I used to listen to back in the day, and it was just, I was just like just repeating garbage and just spitting it out. It's just like, how did I ever think that was okay? And like I said before, up here, I used to watch zombie movies and all that. Huge zombie fan used to be, but now that stuff scares me. Like, I, I don't have a grid for fear anymore, so then when I surround myself with something that's fearful, I, it immediately just affects me. And that's because it's not for me. It's God didn't make me to feel that. So when it says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moth and rust destroy, um, what does that look like, you know? Like, what do you spend your time storing up? You know what I mean? Do you, you know, do you, because, like, my work schedule is pretty intensive, and I have a lot of kids, and I have, um, like, ministry and Holden and stuff like that. It's like, I could be spending my time on a lot of other things. And this is where this Bible verse really got me to um, realize where my priorities were going in my life. And that is Jesus family ministry. And if I ever get those twisted, I'm not doing good. Like I know I'm not doing good. Me and my wife will have an argument or uh, drama will happen in the ministry. And it's not saying that that kind of stuff doesn't happen, but it can happen if you are um, not going after the right thing. And the devil isn't fair, and I don't like to talk about him, but he'll, he'll try to do whatever he can to stop you. And he's, he really sucks. So if your eye is a lamp, that means what you look, what you look at, okay? Um, and like I said um, before up here is um, what really helped me was, you know, like when, when the world sees somebody, you know, what do they see? So, and a good example for me, since I'm a man and something I've overcome is when, you know, like I was in Florida and people wear less clothing and then, you know, when guys look at girls, they see like boobs and butt. Is that, is that what God wants you to see? You know, you shouldn't see that when you look at somebody. And I don't know what girls see when they look like that or whatever, but um, he wants you to see his daughter. That's who he wants you to see. And um, the same is... So a good testimony of seeing people, how God wants you to see them, is how I get into some really, really difficult conversations with some people that would be deemed really difficult people. Um, I went to New Jersey here last week. Yeah, last week. I think it was last week. Everything runs together. Um, I was sitting there, and our flight got delayed. Um, and actually, it didn't even say delayed. It was just like, here's your flight. And then the, the stewardess lady up front was just really just like ticked off. And I just knew that I go up there and I approach her. Uh, she's going to ramble something at me. So I just do what I always do. Hey, how are you? Are you good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, hey, I know you had this question a whole bunch. What's going on? And then I just love how God works. She softened her heart. And she, like, spoke with me, and that was really cool. But I think the reason God did that is because there was this other person behind me that was going to try to do the same thing. And then she saw that this lady spoke soft to me, so she came up to me. And this is somebody that I wouldn't necessarily approach. Um, I think she was wearing, like, a, a Black Lives Matter shirt and had her, had her, had her hair, like, shortly cut. And um, I honestly, when I first saw her, couldn't tell if it was a boy or a girl. Um, but she came up and started talking to me, and she was just like, hey, what's going on? And I was kind of taken back, and in my head, I was thinking in my, my head, well, watch what you say, Jesse, because, you know, some people like social justice and stuff like that, they can get really, like, awfully fired up at just, like, a, a tiny single thing that you would say. But what was really cool is I have my spirit eyes on, and God, uh, God can tell me what's going on. So throughout this conversation with her, and boy, we went through a lot. It was really cool. Um, I have her information now, and she's really, she's a really sweet lady. Um, so she just had, um, she had a kid, and she said she had a kid. And when she said, "I have a kid," I immediately went, "Oh boy, here we go." And then she followed it up with, "But I don't want to assume his gender." It's like, dang. <laughs> so me being me. I don't even know if I should say what I said to her. But it was funny. I was like, well, is it a boy? Did it, does he have the parts? <laughs> she was like, well, yeah, but I want him to decide when he's older. And I'm like, yeah, some people are like that. Why? Why would you want to do that? And then she, like, 
I don't think anybody's asked, ever asked her why, you know? Because I'm not just having a conversation with this lady. I'm invested. God put her in front of me, and I immediately feel his heart for her because I can see her for who she is, not who she's acting like, not who she's dressed like, not for who or how she decided that the world should say she should raise her kid. So when I asked her why, it was kind of like, well, I just, I just want him to decide. And then um, I brought up something I read on Facebook when it said, shout out to my mom for not changing my gender when I was going through my tomboy phase. And that really like softened her up a little bit because she was you know, dressed kind of tomboy and everything. But um, she has a partner, which is a man, so that confused me too. Uh, so she said my partner, so I thought she was with a lady, but it was a man, but she is so into the world that she doesn't want to put a husband on there, and she doesn't want to take that covenant, like the world is destroying the marriage covenant. When I was talking to this lady, I just felt it, and then I, I had an opportunity to say, well, my wife, I love my wife. When I married my wife, there wasn't anybody in this world that God made that could be with me other than her, and then I could just see the, there's just something in the eyes when it happens and you're talking to them that you can see them processing it. Um, so what's really cool is when I got in this conversation with her, God was telling me, you know, be careful, be led. And throughout the whole conversation, I didn't, you know, tell her, hey, you know what? Jesus is king. If you don't turn over and give your life to him, you're going to go to hell and all this kind of stuff like some people do and they try to shove Jesus down somebody's throat. We got to love him. So that's what I got to do with her. And a, a really big talking point is that I have six kids, and I was a stay-at-home dad, and they're all girls. And uh, I'm sorry, guys, I have it easy. Then if I go talk to somebody, that's just an immediate conversation starter. And so I got to tell her a little bit about I wanted to, I wanted to, God wanted me to talk to her about sin and being sin conscious and what God thinks about sin. Um, but I knew that if I started you know, bringing up words like sin and God and stuff like that, it would, it would bring it back out of the conversation. And what's really cool is I got to bring up God a lot, and I got to say his name, and I got to say Jesus, so don't think that I skirted around it because I can never do that. But I brought up an example of, like, when my kids, this is so cool. Um, so up, up here I've said to, um, you know, when somebody sins, um, don't sin because it's the wrong thing to do, don't sin because you love Jesus. And that's the way Jesus wants it to be because Jesus is not sin conscious of you. Like Nathan's, Nathan's message messed me up. It was so good. The conviction, how the Holy Spirit convicts you of righteousness. Whew. Probably listened to that three times, bud. It was, it was like a word from the Lord. Maybe just for me. Who knows? But I got to say, you know what's really cool? Or no, she was talking about uh, how kids are naughty and st- stuff like that. And then I said, actually, you know what? Um, so God wanted me to talk, talk to her about sin. She brought up sin. And then as I was speaking with her about it, I said, you know, here's something that I find really, really successful. Um, I tell my kids that when they do something bad, I don't want to punish them. That is not something I get joy out of. I don't, I'm not happy when I have to ground you. I'm not happy when everybody else gets to watch movies and then you have to read a book. Like, does, that does not make me happy. What that does is that makes me sad. And I'm sorry to say, but you choosing your actions made me feel sad. And I didn't want to punish you. So I can see her thinking about it. She's like, okay, where's this going? And I said, so I've been telling my kids, don't steal that piece of candy, not because you're going to make dad sad, not because you're going to make dad mad, but don't steal that piece of candy because you love your dad. And she was like, Ugh. like she just started like taking it back. And I was just like, whoa, here we go. So we were, we were getting into it and it was, uh, it was getting, it was like right in the middle of the airport. And then all of a sudden we're talking and then another person standing over here and another person standing over here. And she was like, wow, that is so good. Where did you learn that? Like a professor or a psychologist or something? I said, no. I said, I'm a Christian. Jesus taught me that. And when I live my life, I'm very conscious of what he loves because he loves me so much. And she was kind of just like, 
you know, normally if I would have brought that up in any certain, like if I wasn't listening to the Lord in that conversation, I got a chance to just put the gas pedal on and start just ministering into her life. Yeah, it was so cool. And um, <laughs> I just, it was just so cool how excited I was after this conversation because um, I got to tell her, you know, like Jesus taught me that and Jesus loves me. And then all of a sudden she started to, to go into areas of her life where maybe, maybe she was maybe swaying a little bit. And I got to ask her, you know, like, um, so what do you do? And she's like, I'm a yoga instructor, of course. And then um, I got to tell her, she was like, do you do yoga? And I was like, well, kind of. Mine's a different kind of yoga, <laughs> but I don't call it yoga. I call it uh, intercession. You know, I don't call it like there's meditation, and I don't know, really know exactly what yoga is. You guys know what yoga is? Good. <laughs> Dustin's like, nah, not a day. But I, I just got to tell her, you know, like, um, no, I don't, really don't do yoga because, you know, I don't, I don't, and I'm not an expert on yoga or anything, so I don't claim to be. But to me, it was just like a, a inner feelings or chi or whatever you want to call it. I could be completely off. But I got to tell her, um, my meditation looks like going into my bedroom, telling my kids to leave me alone. Better yet, waking up before my kids get up and just spending time with Jesus. And she said, reading the Bible? Sounds boring, right? Absolutely not. That word is alive. So I got to tell her a little bit about, um, and this is so crazy too, because this type of lady, I know this type of lady, and you don't get to say these type of things to these type of people. And we get to, I get to, because why? When I entered that conversation, my only goal was to love her. Even if I didn't say the name of Jesus, I would, and I will, and I always do, but she's going to feel the love of the Father. And I can't minister appropriately if I'm not having a conversation here before I'm having a conversation here. And also, when I'm having that conversation here, I need to still be having that conversation here. Because he, and you know what? It takes a boldness, too, a boldness to step out and say, did you ever play soccer when you were a kid? Yeah. Did you hurt your right knee? Like, that's how those kind of things happen, because God says soccer, right knee. I mean, it just, that's just the way it is when you're listening to him and you're only talking about what he wants to talk about and you don't have your own agenda. You can get into some really tough conversations with some really tough people. And that's what it, I'm really happy that God allows me to do. Because to me, there is no more tough conversations. There used to be. The time that I ministered to this uh, lesbian lady at a gas station behind the counter and that was like, that was the first time that I'd ever reached out and just said, hey, Jesus loves you so much. Do you know that you're worthy? And that meant everything to this lady. And I got to do that. So when you're, so... What I really want you guys to understand is, like, where is your tough conversations in life? And I know I kind of bounced off that last time, and uh, people are like, oh, here's Jesse. He's going to give another evangelist message, and he's going to say, go talk to somebody. But have you talked to somebody since the last time I was up here? Have you, have you stepped out and loved somebody? Have you stepped out and found somebody uncomfortable and just said, hey, my favorite is, I know you don't like me what can we do to change that? You know how many times that's breaking everything? In a really tough meeting uh, with a guy um, over some finances at work, and he had said something that was just, to me, just so yucky in my spirit. Um, it was talking about like money owed and stuff like that. Um, and he was saying, well, if we gave you a credit and nobody knew about it, would you return it? And he was like, nope. I got you, bud. Absolutely we would. That's called integrity, my friend. <laughs> so, like, that kind of conversation, I could have, I could have, like, rah, and, like, matched his energy with my energy. 
But even in those tough conversations, even in those, you know, in the construction field, you know how construction is when people, they're not nice to you and they're not polite and they don't care if they hurt your feelings. But how do we still get to minister to that even when we don't match their energy, you know? Because we have, we have the spirit in us. Peace, joy, hope, sound mind. We got it all. The fullness of Christ. We are the righteousness of Christ. So if anybody's having a hard time, um, like breaking out of their shell on, on ministering to people or even just talking to people, I know it may not look like it, but you're looking at like one of the biggest introverts like there ever was. Like this guy doesn't want to go to the send on Saturday because I have to leave my house. Like my wife is very good at pushing me to go do things. Um, like I don't want to like necessarily host people at my house because my house is for me. But then when I get people in my house, I don't want them to leave. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, can't you guys call out tomorrow? Can't we just, can't we just hang out for one more day? But that's how, um, just for full transparency, how, how the devil tries to attack me. And I know a lot of people here think I'm bold and I'll, I'll go out and I'll talk and I'll do and I'll do and I'll do. And that's like what my testimonies are. But I'm telling you, I'm an introvert at heart. God has made me into a person that just wants to stay home and be with my family. I would rather sit at home and watch TV. I would rather sit at home and blow bubbles with my kids and make a slip and slide and mow my lawn and stuff like that. So there is a shell and you just need to ask God to break it because that's what I had to do too because he says that I have a purpose for your life, that you are called, you are chosen, and you are sent. And uh, when I was at the send, what was really super cool is... I was like, man, to be one of those 19-year-olds down there in the field, just hopping around all day and doing it and loving Jesus and send me, send me, send me. I'll go Nicaragua, Honduras, Africa. And I was kind of just reliving those moments in my head of how I w wasted those times in my years um, not living for the Lord. You know, I could have been doing YWAM. I could have been circuit riders. I could have been going to do all of these things. And I was thinking in my head, God, where do you want to send me? You know, just getting pumped up with the message of, of send and get sent and go. And I was just like, yes, sign me up. I'm 34, got six kids. So where, where do you want to send me? <laughs> Super pumped up. You can send me anywhere, Jesus. I'll go. My wife can stay at home and watch the kids, right? <laughs> More like he'd send my wife instead of me. <laughs> but I, I just got a really, really sound word from the God, from God. And he said, I did send you. You're in Kansas City. Like, like I'm up from South Dakota to Kansas City. And what he said, he said to me, more importantly, I sent you to Church on the Rock. And I was just, I just lost it, you know, because I love you guys. I love where God sent me. I love my purpose for where I'm at. Um, me and Cindy were talking with these guys, and they go to James River Church, uh, where we used to go. And we just said, oh, we miss it so much. There is not a church like that church anywhere, like the leadership, the worship, everything. I don't really, you know, I miss it. Like I said, my, my heart feels like broken, but my spirit is on fire because I'm doing what God told me to do. I'm where God told me to be, and I'm saying what God told me to say, and I'm listening to him. And I just want to be obedient to him. And I want to make a sacrifice that's worthy. And I don't want to store up stuff here on earth. I could have stayed. You know, I've always wanted to be like a detective and a cop and stuff like that. And like get into like, like uh, interrogations. And you put me down in a room with somebody, man, I'll figure them out. But Jesus helps me, so it's kind of cheating. But I figured... <laughs> But I figured that that would be a really good role for me, and I, you know, I could have, I could have stayed in Huron and uh, became a police officer, served my two years, tried to become a detective. But that would have been what I wanted to do, you know. And God doesn't say like, "Oh, you don't want to do what you want to do; you have to do what I want to do." But He puts that desire in your heart, just like they, just like I read in the Bible right here. He puts that desire in your heart. He put a desire in my heart to be in ministry. And what's really funny is where I'm at now didn't look like what I thought it would look like at all. That's because I put together that picture. Because when I was putting together that picture, I wasn't using my spirit eyes. I wasn't using my, my spirit ears. I wasn't 
listening to God in my heart. I said, we're going to go with my friends. We're going to do ministry. And then we had crusades planned in Africa. We had crusades planned in Honduras. And we were going to turn the world upside down. And we had a full schedule, and then COVID happened. Boom. And all that got canceled. And I was like, God, why did you bring me here? And, you know, and our, uh, our ministry got disbanded. Um, they wanted to uh, serve their local church and not um, go out here. So that's what God was calling them to do. And I can't be mad at them for it because they're being obedient to the Lord, even though I didn't feel like that's what the Lord was saying. Because he brought Jesse all the way down from South Dakota, and he brought him out of a really good church and a good job that he loved to do um, to go work in a masonry trade, which I had no idea about masonry. That's like the hardest trade there is, if you ask me. So it really didn't look like what I thought it was going to look like. I thought I was going to be doing worship nights every Friday, a youth group on a Wednesday, flying out to Georgia, flying out to, I was going to say Kansas, but we can just drive there from here. <laughs> Unless you, you really get to that bougie Benny Hinn level and you can just fly to, to, to Kansas from here. That'd be nice. But it didn't look like what I thought it would look like, but I'm so glad that I'm obedient to the Lord. You know, even if it doesn't look like what you think it's going to look like, even when you're getting hurt and you're getting hurt by people that are closest to you, what really matters is Jesus. It's just you. There's no one else in this world that I want to please more than you. And I know that I already please you when I look in your direction. When I speak your name, you are so happy with me. And whatever, whatever trials and stuff come your way, see it. See what God's showing you. Because he said that he will make that path straight. Because when the path isn't straight, you don't know what's around the next corner. But God has the ability to show you what's up there. He has the ability to prepare you for what's to come. And I like how Jesus spoke in parables, and sometimes God uh, speaks that way as well. He's not going to lay it all out for you. If he said, Jesse, there's this, 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 and this, I wouldn't have grown the way that I have grown by being, you know, by, and I'm not saying like, oh, God allows you to be hurt so you can grow, but there's, there's areas of opportunities where you can learn, just like when I got pulled off the road from uh, preaching and ministering so uh, my pastor could could train me on like in, in leadership and in like be the youth pastor. And it was just so confusing why I can come back and share so many testimonies, prayed for 55 people and 15 of them got healed and these people got words. And my pastor was like, what do you think about staying home for a while? Absolutely not. <laughs> I don't think so. I love airplanes. I love airports. I love hotels and I love people. I don't want to be stuck in a town of 12,000 people. After some prayer and consideration, I did what God wanted me to do. And I'm so glad I did because I now have a, a foundation that is set for a good leadership, a good role model, how you're supposed to conduct yourself. And then when I, like, if I see that not happening, one, I have practical advice. Two, I've been through some of it. And three, I can still love those people by the way that I was loved. Um, and I'm telling you, I saw uh, my old pastors, Jeff and Autumn. There is nobody like these two people. I just hope one day I can <laughs> be a Jeff, right? Isn't he just, he's just so good. He always says the right thing. He always loves you. He, he, he affirms you. He corrects you. He's just like everything a leader should be. And I got to, I got to be under that. And I'm really thankful that I was under that because I would, the wind would blow me. You know what I mean? Because you can go and you can minister and you can go do great things, but I was getting ahead of myself. You know, I was taking preaching appointments and crowds and stuff like that. And my pastor knew, because he listens to the Holy Spirit, that Jesse will get a big head and then he'll let it get to him and then he will fall over. And I'm so thankful that he listened to the Lord and that I had the ability to say yes to him. And it doesn't look like what it looks like because trust me, ministering and being on airplanes and hotels is a lot more exciting than uh, going to a youth group every Tuesday or Wednesday and uh, being at early morning meetings for church and stuff like that. And I used to think all that stuff was boring, but I really love that stuff, you know. And my busy schedule now is just 
you know, should I get a new job or what? I need more time. All right, I'm going to bring up another Bible verse. How are we doing on time? 11.18. Uh, let's go to James 1. And some of you already know what's going to be said. So I want to do James 1, um, I believe 2 through 6. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind, kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Woo! Here's trouble. Praise God! Yes! Can you get yourself to that? You know what I mean? Count it all joy. Well, God has a plan for this. So if, if you want to beat yourself up and woe is me and have pity and all that kind of stuff, pick your head up. See what God wants you to see. Because I guarantee there's something good in that disaster that he wants to bring out. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Come on. When your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So my endurance has a chance to grow. It just like I, he's, he's saying that when these tests and these trials come your way, it's to stretch you, it's to work you out, it's to get you ready for what's to come. That way when the wind comes and it blows, you're, you're rooted, you're deeply rooted because you have endurance and you've said, I've seen this before, this is nothing, get beneath me, Satan. He shouldn't be behind you. He should be below you because he's not good enough to be on the same level as you. He never was and he never will be. And the next verse is so good. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete and needing nothing. I don't know about you guys, but needing nothing sounds really great to me. Fulfill it, Lord. Give it. You know it. It's yours. I'm your servant. Let's do it. And then if you need wisdom, ask your generous father. All right, if you need wisdom, ask, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. And do not waver. For a person who has divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Come on, somebody. So what I want to tie that into is you can't serve two masters. So what I want to get a point across to you is that we need to separate ourselves from our flesh. So we need to separate ourselves from our flesh eyes we need to separate ourselves from our flesh ears, and we dang sure need to separate ourselves from our flesh mouth. Yes. What you speak is what you receive. If you complain, then you remain. If you complain and complain and complain, we all know people like that, right? Come on. If they're complaining, love them and say, hey, you know what? If you complain, you remain in the exact same situation you're going to be in. Well, then what am I supposed to do? You proclaim. Because if you proclaim, you gain. You gain the ground. Because I am more than this situation. I am more than this complaint. And if we separate ourselves from our flesh, because you can only, like in, um, in Matthew when I read, you can, only, you can only serve one. You know, you can't serve two. So do you want to serve your flesh? Or do you want to serve your spirit? Like, which, which are you feeding into? So there's, there's like, there's... Ah, I just remembered an analogy that uh, Jeff Mann uses a whole bunch about your, uh, your spirit puppy and your flesh puppy. You guys remember that? Do you remember that, Anna? Oh, wow, that's cool. I just remembered that. So yeah, you have two dogs. One, one's called spirit and one, one's called flesh. So if you feed one or the other, whichever one you feed more is going to be stronger. So are you going to feed your flesh more or are you going to feed your spirit more? Because when you feed your spirit more and you see that person and you get into that conversation, you're ready because your spirit is strong because you feed it. You spend time with Jesus. You spend time just looking at him. You spend time with the door shut, worshiping Jesus. I love you. There's no one like you. 
Because when you feed your spirit, your flesh is just so weak. You're not going to want to look at pornography. You're not going to want to steal something. You're not going to want to slander somebody because that's not in you. Because that's not the tongue. That's not the mouth that you're using. That's not the eyes that you're seeing. So if we can separate ourselves because we can't serve two, we have to serve one. Just like that analogy I said when you're on the fence. And then God's people go away and devil's people go away. And then the devil comes back and says, come on, bud, let's go. And you said, well, I didn't choose him and I didn't choose you. And the devil says, I own the fence. It's the same thing. You you can't serve two. You can't give into your flesh and then, okay, on Sunday, though, I'm going to worship. Praise Jesus. She loves that still. But he says there's more. And I've told you there's more. I told you, feed that spirit. And trust me, it's really, really important to feed your spirit. Because when there's that opportunity at work, when somebody rah, 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 jumps down you, and you're not going to rah, rah, rah them back, because that's not where you're living. That's not, that's not the thing that you're feeding. And then when I talk about going out and ministering, or even just loving people, just talking to them, and some of you guys, you know, we're talking about that shell that you're in, and we need to break that shell. So how do we do that? Just like for wisdom, he says, if you need wisdom, ask. God, I want to, God, I want to do this. This is like my prayer when I first started. God, I want to do this. And I want to do this for you. Because he says that if you ask and you have a wrong motive, you know, he told you that. I love that he said that up there. Because when you do and you ask, make sure this is right. God, I want to reach people only to serve you, only to love you, and only to love them. I don't want a podium. I don't want a platform. I don't want donations. Whatever else comes with it. I don't want people, oh, that was really great. That was super good. You're so anointed. Yes, praise God. Because if somebody ever gives you a compliment, turn it right back to him. Because I can't do or say anything apart from what he says to me. And for me to take credit for any of it would just be the dumbest thing ever. Like, it just makes no sense that, that Jesse... This makes no sense to me when I look into the mirror and I say that, that I'm the person that I am today, you know? Because these guys all knew me, you know what I mean? And I can't, and I, and I, I knew me too, but I, I know who God knows me as, and that's who I get to walk it out as. And it's, it's not something that happens overnight. It can, and it definitely can. But if you don't think, you know, like today, um, I woke up in the morning and I didn't, like, it's just so dumb. Like, I don't even get how the devil can even talk to me. But I just didn't feel qualified, you know. I woke up and I was just like, man, I just, I don't know why I'm preaching. I don't even, you know, just woe is me, pity, pity, pity. And then uh, God reminded me that um, he doesn't choose the qualified. He qualifies the chosen. So if you don't feel qualified, that's okay. Because guess what? There's somebody that you can reach, you can reach, you can reach, you can reach. There's people that you know I couldn't even get in with. I couldn't even talk to. They wouldn't give me the time of day. But God has put you in their sphere of influence, their circle, their oikos. And you alone can be that person. So like I said before, don't get discouraged if you think that it didn't work. Because who are you to say that it didn't work? Are you thinking their thoughts? Are you hearing with their ears? Are you seeing what the Holy Spirit is saying to them? So we are not soul winners. We're seed planters. So as long as we can just keep planting these seeds and loving people, we're going to be good. I hope I'm making sense, guys. All right. So this shirt that I'm wearing today... Can anybody read it? Heal the sick. What else? Anybody else? What is that? Cleanse the leopards. Raise the dead. Cast out demons. All that stuff sounds super cool, huh? (laughs) And I know I've talked about it before. Um, We can do that, guys. We can lay the hands on the sick. 
Do it. You see a person in a cast? Do it. What's holding you back? You're holding yourself back. Because God wants you to do it. He wants you not only for that person to get healed, but for him to show his glory and his presence and his power and that he loves them. And what's really funny, you know, uh, let's see, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers. That sounds a little familiar, though. Uh, Like leprosy isn't really a, a prominent thing now, but, you know, there's HIV, there's COVID, you know. Where does that, where does leprosy relate to nowadays, you know? I had a buddy uh, named Bobby. He just passed away. I love Bobby. Bobby was so good. Um, He had HIV. Um, And the story of how he got HIV was absolutely crazy, like Illuminati type stuff. Um, God healed him. That is an absolute thing that I know in my heart that is so real. I've seen the test. I've seen it. It's been done. He can do that. Raise the dead. Anybody here prayed for a dead person? There's my people. Sounds pretty crazy, right? A person's dead. We're going to go lay hands and see him raised. David Hogan, I know I've talked about this, but he does that a lot. Um, but the point I wanted to get to is the last one. Cast out demons. When we wear something like this, it's just not a cool shirt. I believe in every single thing on this shirt. And I will run after every single thing on this shirt. So about two weeks ago, um, we are at our, our ministry in Holden. And um, it's a coffee shop, and people come in a lot and stuff like that. Um, so about a year and a half ago when I first moved here, I was at Casey's uh, gas station in Warrensburg. And uh, me and my friend, we saw this lady, and uh, we started ministering to her. And actually, what's really bad is I just moved here, and I was on my Walmart kick. And she came in with her kid, walked around for a little bit, and left without paying any for anything. So in my head, I said she probably stole something. Come on. How am I going to love that lady if I just automatically make an accusation at her that she probably stole something? But praise God, I had my brother with me, and he said, hey, Let's go love her. I said, love her? She probably stole something. And he goes, isn't that great? <laughs> Thank God he had his spirit ears and eyes on, you know what I mean? Because I wasn't thinking that way. Because I saw, you know, and that was the very thing that I was supposed to uphold was righteousness. And all of a sudden I'd make an, a judgment against this lady and then I don't go minister because that's who I am. That's who God made me to be. And the devil just tried to take me outside of it for just one split second, but he didn't know I had my brother with me. So that's really good. So fast forward, uh, we see this lady in Holden, and she's walking around and all that kind of stuff, and we're like, no kidding. And me and my friend looked at each other, and we're like, that's her, isn't it? And we haven't seen her for like a year. So it turns out that she goes to this small town of Holden. And we start to get to, like, minister to her and stuff like that. And then um, she's really struggling. And, I mean, I'm talking just, like, drug addiction, had her kid taken away from her, was living in a storage unit. Her dog was a really big priority over food and cigarettes and stuff like that. And even though she wasn't telling me she's on drugs, I can see when somebody's on drugs. Like, I just God gives me, like, a, I just know it. Um, So through talking to her, and she came, and she said, I'm going to get this and this and that. And I said, listen, sit down. We're going to take care of this right now. And uh, me and my friends, uh, Tiffany and Jason, um, we kind of are really in sync when it comes to these kind of things. And we knew that it was time to get that out of her because this thing was controlling her life. It wasn't letting her make good decisions because what was she feeding? She was feeding her flesh and with that come these kind of things. And we sat her down and we got to give the absolute authority of God. It was so cool because if we wouldn't have ministered to this lady in Warrensburg. We wouldn't have met her. We wouldn't have had this opportunity. We wouldn't have this rapport. 
And time and time again, she took from us and took from us and took from us and took from us without giving us anything back. But we don't need anything back because we're going to give it to her because we love her. And she got to sit there, and I don't really want to go uh, too much into it, but we cast that demon out. And that demon, you know, wasn't nice, tried to speak, and uh, she was saying stuff like, I don't, I don't want to let it go. That's, that's what I know. I've, I, and she was just, she was trying to love this thing, and that just really made me angry. <laughs> and it was cool because I got to bring the authority of God, and I said, no, not today. <laughs> no longer will you, will you trouble my sister. You must come out, and you must leave now in Jesus' name. And what was cool, what got that thing to leave was for her to profess the name of Jesus. I don't, I don't want it, she said. She said, I don't want it, please leave. I said, no, 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 we're not nice. That's not nice, we're not nice. Being nice is over. Leave now, in Jesus' name. Felt it, felt it leave her. Saw her eyes. She got like really dizzy and she got really flushed in the face. And I could just see the spirit on her. And we've been working on this for about a year and a half, you know. Very next day, signs up for a rehab program. And jumps straight into it. Leaves her house, leaves everything. She says, I need to get my daughter back. Yeah. She said, how could I be so blind to live in a storage shed and neglect my daughter like that? how I viewed my, my pet as more than me. And so, yeah, she was just going through all these things and all these revelations like boom, 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 boom. And that's because the flesh was bigger than the spirit. And it's so easy to see these lies from the enemy because they're lies and we recognize them because we know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Free indeed. Free at last. So, Like I said, when you wear a shirt like this, it's not just a cool, a cool thing to wear. This is a statement for me. This is a statement, and it says, bring your sick, bring your lepers, bring your dead, bring your demon-possessed, because I have the authority and the power of Jesus Christ. I will lay hands, and it has to go. And this confidence sometimes looks like arrogance, but definitely it's not. I know who I am. And I know who he made me to be, and I will not take anything less. Because you're not going to just pass somebody by, church. I'm telling you. Please, this week, see somebody. See somebody right now. I want you guys to close your eyes for me. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We thank you that you're here. We ask for an increase in your presence. Holy Spirit, I just ask you, I just ask you to show us. Show us right now. Show us right now that person. God, let us not second guess that person. Let us not second guess that person that you just showed us, Lord. God, if we lack wisdom, we ask you, Lord, give me wisdom. How can I love this person? Is it a brother? Is it a sister? Is it the homeless man that you always see at the gas station by the quick trip? Is it the big burly guy at work? Jesus, I just ask you right now to give us revelation on their life. God, give us a strategy to love these people. God, I ask for increase in boldness right now, an impartation of boldness right now. Right now over everybody in this church, God, I just ask for an increase in boldness. Increase, increase. God, I thank you for love. I thank you for love right now, God. I thank you for spirit eyes, God. I thank you for a heart that is soft. God, this, this world has tried to beat us down, but we aren't of this world, and it can't beat us down anymore. So God, from this moment, we just declare that our heart is tender and soft to your word. God, help us love people. Help us see people. Help us hear people. Help us talk to people. 
Holy Spirit, I just ask that you're in every single conversation that we ever have for the rest of this week. Jesus, I ask you for, for there's, like a, there's like a people group, there's like a, a spot in the city that somebody's thinking about that they need to just go stand and hang out in. God, I just thank you for that. I just thank you that when we lay hands on the sick, God, I thank you right now that there's somebody here that hasn't seen a healing and doesn't necessarily believe in it, God. I thank you that you're going to give them an opportunity to lay hands on the sick. God, I thank you that you're going to give them boldness to lay hands on the sick. God, I thank you that they're going to be healed and that you're going to bolster this person's faith. So if that's you and you, you, you kind of you kind of think that maybe that thing's for somebody else, it's not. It's for you. God, I thank you for the ability to see into the spirit, God. I thank you for the ability to read people's mail, to tell things about themselves that nobody knows but you. God, and I thank you that we're a good steward of this information, Lord, that we are only doing this because we love you and no other reason other than it's you. It's you that we want to love. It's you that we want to serve. It's you that we want to please, God. Help us. Help us reach the lost people, God. Help us reach the people who don't think they're lost, God. Help us reach the complainers, God. Help us, help us reach the slanderers. Help us reach the thieves, God. God, I just thank you right now that you're moving on hearts. God, I ask for a, an impartation of your spirit to rest on everybody, that, that church is just not something you do on Sunday and Wednesday, God that I sign up and I say yes every day and I need to spend time with you because when I look in your direction, I ravish your heart. And if I can ravish your heart, there is nothing better in this world that I want than to please you, to ravish your heart. I just love you, Jesus. I love you too. I love you too.